Okay, hello everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Pathways to Prosperity virtual workshop series. Our presentation today is titled Discrimination and Other Challenges Experienced by Racialized Newcomers When Accessing Settlement Services in Southwestern Ontario. Before we get started today, we'll just go around and introduce ourselves to everyone, and we'll also give some time to people to come into the room. So I'll start. Hi, everyone. My name is Sofia Agustin, and I'm a researcher at the Network for Economic and Social Trends at Western University. I completed my master's in sociocultural anthropology in December and have since been working in various community-based research roles, including now as project assistant at the London Middlesex Local Immigration Partnership. And I'll pass it over to Emily. Thanks, Sophia. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Emily, and I am the coordinator of the research consultancy at the Network for Economic and Social Trends at Western University. Um, and so my job is to help with coordinating these types of projects where we're doing uh, community-based applied research um, in partnership with community organizations. And I'll pass it over to Rama. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Rama Lulebi. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Western in social psychology. Uh, my research kind of focuses broadly on themes related to immigration, discrimination, and interpersonal relations more generally. Uh, I worked as a graduate student assistant at NEST for this project, so the Network of Economic and Social Trends. Um, and we are very excited to share the findings with you and kind of talk you through uh, what we did for the project. So I'll pass it back over to Sophia. Great, thank you, Rama. Definitely, just like Rama says, we'll be getting into the presentation in one minute. I'm just gonna begin before uh, with a land acknowledgement. So, I begin today by respecting and acknowledging the traditional territory upon which we gather, the original peoples of Turtle Island. We honor and respect the history, languages, and culture of the diverse status and non-status Indigenous peoples who call this territory home. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous people, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. We also acknowledge the historical fact that this land is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Attawandaran peoples. We acknowledge all the treaties that are specific to this area, such as the Two Row Wampum Belt Treaty of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Silver Covenant Chain, the Beaver Hunting Grounds of the Haudenosaunee Nanfan Treaty of 1701, the Lennon Township and Samba Treaties of 1796, with Chippewa of the Thames and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum of the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee. The neighboring three indigenous nations to Lennon and Middlesex are the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, Munsee Delaware Nation, who all continue to live as sovereign nations with individual and unique languages, cultures, and customs. This land, land acknowledgement is the first step towards reconciliation and is work of all residents, all settlers, to work towards decolonizing practices and bringing our awareness into action. Thank you, everyone. And so just like I mentioned, I think now we can begin. Uh, just as a reminder, our presentation today is titled Discrimination and Other Challenges Experienced by Racialized Newcomers When Accessing Settlement Services in Southwestern Ontario. And I'll pass it to Emily now. Great, thank you, Sophia. Um, so as Sophia mentioned, today we're going to be talking about uh, a research study that we conducted to better understand the experiences of racialized newcomers living in Southwestern Ontario. And we were interested in the various factors that can impede or facilitate access to and use of settlement services. Uh, and these things are talked about a bit more in the study report that we published. But for today's workshop, we're going to focus primarily on discrimination and the effects that discrimination has on newcomers and their use of settlement services. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to mention that this project was funded by IRCC and was conducted through a partnership between Pathways to Prosperity and the Network for Economic and Social Trends uh, Research Consultancy at Western University. 
Uh, we also had a project advisory committee, which included members from local immigration partnerships in eight regions of southwestern Ontario. So that includes Chatham-Kent, um, Guelph-Wellington, Hamilton, London and Middlesex, Niagara, Oxford County, Sarnia-Lambton, and St. Thomas-Elgin. Um, and the individuals uh, as, who worked as part of the project advisory committee provided us with suggestions and feedback on our study design, the study report, and they also help with recruiting participants from each of their respective regions. So as we know, settlement services provide newcomers with really crucial support during the integration process when they come to Canada. But it's also well known that there are many barriers and issues that newcomers can face when attempting to access and use these services. Um, this can include things like a lack of knowledge about what and where services are available, uh, issues with resources that can limit how many clients can be served, and ineligibility of certain types of newcomers, and discrimination. Uh, discrimination can be defined as behavior that disproportionately favors or provides an advantage to people belonging to some groups, while disadvantaging or harming people belonging to other groups. And it can come in many forms. Um, it can be subtle, like through microaggressions. It can be overt, like with blatant racism. Um, and it can be interpersonal or systemic, meaning that it can be something that happens between people or something that occurs as a result of unfair practices and systems that exist in society or organizations. And we know that this is something that happens in settlement and discrimination likely has the potential to affect newcomers experiences with settlement and their desire to use services. So it's important to understand what is occurring so we know how to improve things. So that was the main goal of our study was to better understand the challenges and especially discrimination experienced by newcomers when accessing settlement services. Um, but we also wanted to focus on the experiences of a certain group of newcomers. So specifically those who are racialized and who are accessing services in the small and mid-sized communities in Southwestern Ontario. And I'll explain why we thought that this was important to do. To start with, we wanted to focus on racialized newcomers because a large proportion of the newcomer population in Canada is racialized. Um, in 2021, for example, almost 70% of the immigrant population in Canada was racialized, and this number is even higher among the population of recent immigrants. So many newcomers are racialized, and we also know that compared to non-racialized newcomers, racialized newcomers are more likely to experience certain challenges, um, things like poverty, unpaid care work, and marginalization in their everyday lives. So effective settlement services are particularly important for racialized newcomers who may have to overcome additional challenges. We also wanted to focus on small and mid-sized communities because smaller and rural areas are often overlooked in this type of research. Um, most of the existing research on immigrants' experiences with discrimination has focused on large urban centers or national samples. And the results of these studies are certainly valuable, but they may not be directly applicable to smaller communities because social dynamics tend to differ between larger and smaller communities. Um, smaller communities tend to be less diverse than larger communities, and that can lead to residents feeling uncomfortable around people from different cultures or apprehensive about shifts in the community's demographic makeup. So factors like these mean that racism and discrimination can be particularly evident in smaller communities. So all things considered, we thought that it would be valuable to understand, to better understand the discrimination experienced by racialized newcomers in southwestern Ontario. And the purpose of this wasn't to lay blame or to point fingers, um, but just to gain insight into how things can be improved. So the purpose of our study was to develop evidence-based recommendations about how the settlement sector can support the needs of racialized newcomers in small and mid-sized communities. 
And we focused on southwestern Ontario, so our recommendations are particularly relevant for this region, but they may also be applicable to other small and mid-sized communities in other regions of the country. We didn't have any specific predictions going into the study, but we did have some broad research questions that we wanted to try to answer. So first of all, what are the challenges that newcomers face when accessing settlement services in southwestern Ontario? Um, do racialized newcomers experience racism and discrimination at settlement services? And do these experiences differ across people from different groups? So, for example, do they differ across people with different uh, demographic characteristics or other characteristics? Do they differ across different types of organizations? And do they differ from the experiences of non-racialized newcomers? We were also interested in exploring things from the perspective of settlement providers. So what are settlement providers' perceptions of the challenges that newcomers face at their organizations? And are they aware of any racism and discrimination that occurs? And what are settlement providers in Southwestern Ontario currently doing to promote cultural competency? And finally, the question that speaks the most directly to the purpose of our study, um, what strategies can organizations use to improve the experiences of racialized newcomers when accessing settlement services to ensure that all clients are treated in a non-discriminatory way? To address all of these questions, we used a qualitative approach involving interviews with both newcomers and employees at settlement organizations. Um, we refer to these employees as key informants. And this was across eight regions of southwestern Ontario, the same eight regions where our members of our project advisory committee were from. And the interviews themselves were conducted by nine research assistants who were a culturally and academically diverse group of graduate students from Western's Faculty of Social Science. And the students were trained on how to conduct the interviews in a way that was consistent and comprehensive while treating respondents with respect and sensitivity. Uh, the interviews were conducted through Zoom and were audio and video recorded so that we could refer back to these files during analyses. The interviews were semi-structured, meaning that we had interview guides with questions and probes. So in the example on the screen, the questions are on the left and the probes are on the right. And as you can see, the questions are fairly broad, whereas the probes are a little bit more specific. So the interviewer would start by asking a question and then they could proceed to the probes if the interviewee didn't provide certain details in their response to the question. So the interview process is somewhat structured in the sense that there are specific questions that are asked, but there's also some flexibility in terms of what probes are used and the direction that the conversation goes based on the interviewee's responses. And we had two interview guides, one for newcomer respondents and one for key informants. And both of these were created through consultation with the project advisory committee. The newcomer interviews were one and a half to two hours long, whereas key informant interviews were between one and one and a half hours long. And the newcomers were asked about both their personal experiences with settlement and their observations about how others are treated at settlement organizations. And they were also asked for suggestions about what settlement organizations could do to ensure that they are welcoming to all people. Uh, key informants were asked about their perceptions of newcomers' experiences both in their region and at their organization, as well as their personal experiences at, their, at the organization that they work at. Uh, and they were also asked about the strategies that their organization currently uses and could use to ensure that they are welcoming to all people. Now, although we were interested in discrimination, we did not use the word discrimination when speaking to respondents. Um, instead, we asked about unfair treatment and exclusion because of who they or others are, and factors that hindered or facilitated access to and use of services. Um, so we opted for this more indirect approach for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, discrimination can sometimes be seen as taboo to talk about. 
And different people may have different personal understandings of what the word discrimination means. So by using phrases like unfair treatment and exclusion, we were able to talk about discrimination while minimizing potential reactants from respondents and avoiding any potential issues due to different interpretations of the word discrimination. We also wanted to gain a more nuanced understanding of the situation. So asking about both barriers and facilitators provided us with a more comprehensive picture of what's going on. And we hoped that this would make respondents feel more comfortable as well, because it allowed them to also talk about positive experiences instead of focusing only on negative ones. Uh, the newcomer respondents were recruited from each of the eight regions in many ways, including through posters, newsletters, social media, etc. And the members of the project advisory committee helped a lot with the recruitment process, and the research assistants also visited settlement and community organizations throughout the regions to distribute recruitment material. Um, the recruitment material was available in eight languages, and it directed interested individuals to complete an online pre-screening survey, which was used to assess eligibility. Uh, to be eligible to participate, uh, newcomers needed to be 18 years of age or older, and to have used settlement services in one of the eight regions within the past three years. And our final sample for this group included 94 newcomers. Uh, as I mentioned, interviews were conducted by graduate student research assistants, and we were very fortunate to have a group of students who spoke many different languages. So if a participant wanted to be interviewed in a language other than English, we either paired them with an interviewer who spoke their preferred language, or we hired a professional interpreter. Uh, in the end, 59 newcomers were interviewed in English, none in French, and 35 were interviewed in a language other than English or French. All of the newcomer respondents had used settlement services in the past three years, but the length of time that they had been in Canada for ranged from one month to 14 years, with an average time of two years in Canada. Respondents had first entered Canada through a variety of different programs, uh, with the largest group having entered Canada as resettled refugees. Uh, there were 36 participants who had entered through this way. The majority of newcomers, uh, 57 of them identified as women, and none of the respondents indicated that they were non-binary. Uh, the ages of newcomers ranged from 21 to 68 years old, with the average being 37 and a half years old. And newcomers' racial and ethnic backgrounds spanned 10 categories, and we classified them as either racialized or non-racialized, non based on their self-reported racial and ethnic background. And given their representation in the immigrant population and our focus on racialized newcomers, we were particularly interested in recruiting racialized newcomers who made up 86.2% of the final sample. For the key informants, uh, we asked the project advisory committee for suggestions of people who would be able to provide good insights into the settlement sector. And we also looked online for information about employees at settlement organizations. We then contacted people to confirm eligibility and to ask if they would be interested in participating. And to be eligible to participate, key informants needed to be 18 years of age or older and to have been working in the settlement sector in one of the eight regions for at least one year. And our final sample for this group included 15 key informants. The key informants had worked in the settlement sector for between one and 25 years, with the average being eight years, and their ages ranged from 30 to 62 years old, with an average of 42 and a half years old. The majority of the key informants were working at mainstream organizations, um, meaning organizations that serve both immigrants and non-immigrants, while two were employed at immigrant-specific organizations and one had worked at both types of, in of organizations. Uh, as with the newcomers, the majority of key informants identified as women and none indicated that they were non-binary. 
The majority of key informants were also immigrants themselves, with only three having been born in Canada. And the majority were also racialized. Uh, once the interviews were done, we analyzed the interview data using a technique called thematic analysis. And this is a qualitative analysis technique that involves coding and sorting the data based on patterns and themes in the data set. And we really wanted to allow the respondents' own words to remain at the heart of our findings. So the report includes many direct quotes from respondents, and you'll see some of those quotes uh, throughout this presentation as well. In looking for patterns, we identified things that had been said by multiple respondents, so looking for consistency, as well as things that were unique to only one or a few respondents. We also used a gender-based analysis plus approach to try to understand how respondents' experiences were shaped by the various intersecting dimensions of their identities. So we looked at how their experiences were affected by things like their racial and ethnic background, um, their level of English proficiency, and other demographic and external factors. Uh, I'm now going to turn things over to Sophia, who's going to take us through some of the results from these analyses. Thank you, Emily. And before I just get into my section, I wanted to remind all participants that while we're in the presentation, you may put your questions, any questions you may have into the chat box, or at the end, we'll be having a Q&A section that you can then ask your questions as well by raising your hand um, to the raising, raising hand mechanism. So those are two ways. Thank you. So as we go into this, so this analysis distinguishes between immigrant serving agencies and mainstream organizations and examining the discrimination faced by racialized newcomers. So of the 12 racialized newcomers who experienced discrimination, five experienced it within immigrant serving agencies. These incidents include explicit racism, derogatory comments related to immigration class and discrimination based on sexual orientation. These situations also consider interpersonal and systemic discrimination. In this quote, an Arab man encountered explicit racism at an immigrant serving agency, specifically experiencing derogatory comments related to their immigration class and sexual orientation, particularly while accessing settlement services. It states, I felt she was ignoring me after I came in as an LGBTQ plus refugee. I will never forget the day when I was leaving the hotel and she said, if you were my son, I would kill you. We asked her multiple times if there was an organization that would help LGBTQ people and she never helped. We also identified systemic discrimination affecting several racialized individuals at immigrant serving agencies. In this instant, an Arab woman reflects experiencing inflexible class scheduling that did not accommodate um, their, her diverse needs, including her situation with dealing with a long-term disability, which led her to experience exclusion. Since I came to Canada, I've been sick. The settlement workers were not able to help me with anything. I'm sick and spending time visiting doctors. I went to school for only two months. I'm registered, but they asked me not to come because I couldn't come due to being sick. So on the other hand, seven racialized newcomers reported discrimination at mainstream organizations. And these often took in the form of microaggressions, preferential treatment based on ethnicity or nationality, immigration class, and English proficiency, which also resulted in exclusionary behavior. An Arab man describes facing microaggressions and assumptions based on ethnicity in a mainstream agency. He states, the guy at first was entering my data and he pressed refugee. It's not because I am an Arab that I am a refugee. We don't have a war in Morocco. So that's the thing I didn't appreciate because he can just ask me what program I am enrolled in. And in this quote, a Latin American woman described facing discrimination at a mainstream organization while accessing language and youth services. During the youth services, the people that were leaving spoke in Arabic because the majority were speaking in Arabic. My sister and I were the only ones who spoke Spanish because we couldn't understand. We asked them to speak in English and they didn't. We felt it was rude, so we stopped going. 
And in this interview, in this quote, sorry, an Ethiopian woman described her experience early on accessing employment services as a newcomer, specifically in experiencing language-based discrimination. She explains, they were surprised that I had the language skills and they said, you're not like the others. And that is discrimination in itself. Also, they were telling me that you start this way because everyone who came from my country, they were looking for labor jobs before they worked in the office. Meanwhile, two non-racialized individuals reported experiencing discrimination, which they described as preferential treatment by agency workers. And these both occurred, these both situations occurred in mainstream organizations. And in particular, these two individuals described preferential treatment uh, given to people of the same nationality as the worker or based on ethnic racial background, which also led to feelings of social exclusion. And so now we'll be discussing the impact of discrimination. So many racialized newcomers, nine of the 14 specifically, shared how discrimination, particularly in mainstream agencies, had profound impacts on their engagement with settlement services. Key sentiments included disengagement, self-reliance, emotional distress, and avoidance of services. I've included some quotes here to generally understand some sentiments. For example, we have no choice, we have no other choices because the treatment we received wasn't fair. So it did affect our decision. I left the activities and chose not to come back. My husband went into depression. He was really depressed. You can see him cry for no reason. You can see him angry for no reason. And so while we were also ex uh, examining the discrimination that people personally experience, we also looked at the discrimination experienced by others. And so all reports of witnessing or hearing about discrimination came from racialized individuals. Nine respondents observed, uh, observed and, or heard about incidents of discrimination when others accessed settlement services, often influenced by intersecting factors, including ethnic racial background, immigration class, English proficiency, religion, disability, and often manifesting in preferential treatment of certain newcomer groups. And this discrimination was observed in both immigrant serving and mainstream organizations. So in this quote, an Arab man described his experience with witnessing discrimination in a mainstream agency. He explains, I felt I was treated well in comparison to a Black woman that was there. I felt I was more welcome in comparison to her as a refugee. The way he was talking to her was so tense. I didn't like how he was talking to her. They were speaking in Arabic because she doesn't speak English, so it seemed so hard for her. Just because he was in front of a good profile, permanent resident, and someone who speaks the language, English and French, I shouldn't be treated better. I felt it was discrimination of her class. He should treat everyone the same way, regardless of skin color, refugee or not. And another participant, a Latin American woman, described her experience in a mainstream organization. She explains, I've heard some youth say that the workers don't like them and that they are not their first option. You hear a lot of comments of them being excluded and then you see how they stop going to those agencies. And so just like Emily also mentioned, we were looking at key informants' perception of discrimination as one of our key research questions. And so key informants, as we described in our study, primarily settlement service providers, generally reported positive experiences for immigrants accessing settlement services in Southwestern Ontario, stating that they have not, they have never witnessed or reported discrimination. For example, some ones mentioned, no, never, never. I don't think anyone feels excluded. And, and in my agency, no, if that happened, whoever did that would be in big trouble. And they also credited the success of their services as measured by client satisfaction, where clients often bring other family members or friends and, and as they were often pleased with the services that were provided. Our clients, they always provide good feedback. So our clients, they always provide feedback. If this person brings another family to our center, it's because they received a good service. 
However, these positive reports conflict with the lived experiences of discrimination shared by racialized newcomers in the study, highlighting a possible disconnect between the two perspectives and experiences. Taking it back to our previous session by Emily, implicit or unconscious bias may play a role here where our key informants may not recognize certain discriminatory behaviors or may unintentionally overlook them. And so while we also just discussed the discrimination that they observed, we also ask informants about what their organizations are currently doing to promote cultural competency and EDID prep, equity, and diversity, and inclusion practices and policies that they have currently in place. And these include diversity in hiring, offering services and materials in different languages, hosting and attending events that celebrate different cultures, and discussion between coworkers and staff training. A key informant states, they make sure to hire diverse employees, ensuring there are different languages and ethnicities. We receive a lot of training regarding this. We also, we are also taught how to avoid misunderstandings in terms of culture. Often, we try to match clients with similar background settlement workers to minimize this issue. And another key informant states, we share a lot of local events. We have a lot of newcomers that come to our area and are having street festivals and are hosting events where we can learn more about how they celebrate those cultures and what celebration means to them. Understanding when events are happening and how that might affect someone's ability to receive services. And we also looked at EDI training and policies. So almost all of the key informants knew of a policy or policies that their organization had in place to ensure that staff treat all clients and each other in a culturally sensitive way. Many noted that the policies were related to anti-discrimination, anti-oppression, EDID, and being culturally sensitive. However, the level and type of training vary between workshops and informal discussions. Some key informants indicated that they did not know what the specific policy entails, as management or human resources typically handles matters of discrimination and EDI. And while many key informants mentioned policies promoting cultural sensitivity and anti-discrimination policies, there were some uncertainty written regarding the specifics. One key informant says, I think most of them would be based in anti-discrimination, but I don't know them specifically. Another key informant states, we do have our policies, our mission, and our vision. I think we currently have a new one after the executive director left. It changes based on the executive directors. However, broadly, it is under the EDI guidelines. And another key informant states, I guess most of them would be based in anti-discrimination. I don't know the policies off by heart, unfortunately. If I don't know them specifically, probably not incredibly effective. And so now I turn it to Rama, who will discuss the recommendations and strategies for newcomers, key informants, and for specific organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. So as Emily mentioned, a, a large or like one of the main goals of this project was really to look at suggestions and recommendations moving forward. We asked newcomers for strategies that they would suggest for organizations to ensure that everyone feels welcome. And their suggestions focused on uh, three key areas. Firstly, looking at accessibility and inclusivity through language and communication. So this could include offering translation, interpretation, and multilingual support, providing sign language interpretation services and assistive listening devices, as well as improving the way that organizations communicate with community members. So for this, newcomers suggested collecting and incorporating feedback from community members directly and providing cultural competency and diversity training for staff. The second area uh, looked at knowledge of and access to settlement services. Uh, newcomers suggested creating centralized websites or centralized locations of information and resources. As many newcomers pointed out that the general lack of awareness about settlement services is part of the issue. Uh, some suggested providing comprehensive information at border points or initial entry locations to Canada, ensuring that newcomers are aware of the available support services to them from the onset of their arrival. Lastly, newcomers uh, suggested support networks uh, in which newcomers would uh, 
or, or in which uh, newcomer uh, support networks would be established, uh, taking into account the diversity and all the different cultural backgrounds of the newcomers who would be able to support each other uh, and support others that come from similar backgrounds. Uh, this would be done in collaboration with the organizations themselves and perhaps with other nonprofit organizations that are available locally. And the aim of the networks would be to reduce feelings of isolation for newcomers and to facilitate the dissemination of essential information. We also asked key informants, who are often service providers themselves, on what organizations can do to make sure that newcomers feel welcome and to improve their experiences overall. The suggestions focused on four main areas. Firstly, they spoke about educating and training the staff. So this included making cultural uh, competency training mandatory and paid to ensure that everyone actually attends these trainings. Uh, this kind of training can include creating space wherein uh, employees can learn from each other by sharing their own personal and professional experiences, as well as learning from guest speakers and other professionals. This training should extend to staff in mainstream organizations and schools uh, who interact with the newcomers, despite them not being service providers themselves. Uh, in addition, key informants further echoed the importance of educating newcomers and raising awareness of the available services for them. Key informants further highlighted the need for additional funding and resources, as budget limitations have meant the or that organizations are inadequately prepared to deal with crises, and additional funding would allow organizations to support newcomers' uh, transportation costs, for example. This would allow certain merge marginalized newcomers to access the support that they need. Addressing systemic barriers was another key area that key informants indicated uh, needing to have uh, recommendations or suggestions for. They primarily indicated that settlement workers often feel that their hands are tied when it comes to helping those that do not fall under regulation, or they end up helping them anyway off the record and sometimes at personal cost. Key informant suggestions also addressed communication as a key area of focus, but turned instead to improving communication between the agencies and organizations that serve the newcomers and the multiple levels of government. They noted that this allows for standardization of information uh, and reduces any misinformation. Lastly, key informants suggested implementing and improving methods for reporting discrimination and obtaining feedback from the newcomers. Uh, making sure to allow for anonymity, for ease, and for efficiency when reporting any discrimination experienced while the newcomers were accessing services. And for this kind of reporting to begin as soon as they are approved to come to Canada or at the border. They suggested that this kind of reporting would deter discrimination from those uh, delivering the services and would ensure that everyone is held accountable. So given the findings from the study, including suggestions from the respondents themselves, our research team with the help of the project advisory committee compiled a list of recommendations that focused primarily on the reduction and addressing the discrimination and racism that is faced by newcomers accessing settlement services. These evidence-based recommendations are grounded in anti-discrimination policy, cultural competency, equitable and inclusive organizational practices, and enhancing the awareness of and the right to settlement service supports. I will go over some of them in the next few slides, but will not be able to provide a comprehensive review in the interest of time. So I really do urge you to visit the full report if you are interested in this list. So starting off with the first set of recommendations, um, we really, uh, it seemed that the focus was primarily on implementing strong policies and practices. We recommend that organizations develop, implement, and publicize clear policies that explicitly prohibit discrimination based on race, ethnicity, language, immigration class, sexual orientation, and other personal characteristics, and to ensure that all employees and patrons are fully aware of this policy. We recommend that organizations conduct regular paid uh, mandatory employee training sessions on cultural competency, countering stereotypes and discrimination, encouraging perspective taking, and educating on what constitutes discrimination. 
they should ensure that this training is provided to staff in all departments, especially in mainstream organizations. So not just those that are directly involved in delivering settlement services. And this could include administrative staff, volunteers and interns, any support or facility staff, as well as senior management and executives. We further recommend organizations incorporate consented testimonials from newcomers in which they share their own experiences of racism and discrimination that they encountered while accessing settlement services in the regular training sessions for staff. And this will provide real life context and deepen the staff's understanding of the discrimination that newcomers face and the impact that this kind of discrimination might have. When doing so, staff at all levels should be encouraged to reflect on and address the potential implicit biases that are present in their own attitudes and their own behavior. Organizations should also implement evidence-based programs only, focusing on cultural competency, anti-discrimination, and inclusive practices. They should continuously gather and analyze data that verifies the effectiveness of these programs within the organization's particular context. And this could include conducting regular audits with external evaluators that will help assess the effectiveness of their policies and training programs. Moreover, organizations should um, create accessible and confidential mechanisms for newcomers to report incidents of discrimination without any fear of retaliation. Organizations should ensure that there's a prompt and effective follow-up process for the reported issues and this will likely include the involvement of a third party to further protect against any fear of retaliation or any conflict of interest. Organizations should uh, conduct regular evaluations of settlement services to identify areas of improvement with a specific focus again on anti-racism and anti-discrimination. They should incorporate feedback from the newcomers directly to ensure that these evaluations are informed by the newcomers' experiences and perspectives. This is especially important as providers may not realize the harm that they're doing or may be discriminating unintentionally, as was mentioned earlier. Now, the next set of recommendations focused on promoting equity within the organizations. Uh, organizations should foster an inclusive culture by promoting the recruitment and retention of a diverse workforce that mirrors the community. Uh, looking at their demographics, their ethnic backgrounds, the languages they speak, as well as the lived experiences of community members. Nonetheless, organizations should ensure that service providers from all nationalities and all ethnicities are equally welcoming to individuals from other communities as they would be to individuals from their own communities. Organizations should also adapt service schedules and formats to accommodate diverse needs. So this includes newcomers with disabilities, newcomers who have part-time or full-time work schedules, and those who have varying language proficiencies. Uh, organizations can provide interpretation services, ensure that multilingual support staff are available at all, if not most times, uh, who can assist newcomers that don't speak English and French and to ensure that critical information and materials is available in multiple languages, as well as providing assistive hearing devices and sign language services. Our last set of recommendation focuses on raising the awareness and understanding of newcomers of available settlement services. Having the necessary information and understanding their rights and responsibilities as newcomers is essential to improving their experiences. And so we really recommend that organizations provide clear and accessible information about the rights and resources that are available to newcomers, thus empowering them to recognize and report discriminatory behavior while they are accessing their settlement services. Organizations should ensure newcomers understand their entitlement to certain resources and references and uh, services, uh, further reinforcing that accessing the service is their right and not a favor that anyone is doing them. And lastly, uh, organizations should distribute information about available settlement services for newcomers through different targeted outreach and informational campaigns. This likely includes collaborating with LIPS and RIFS, as well as other local community organizations and uh, hosting community events and workshops. This uh, could allow such dissemination to be more engaging and will allow uh, the fostering of more of a community sense. 
So we've reached the end of our um, presentation. I want to thank you all for attending the talk today. And before we head into the Q&A portion of today's session, uh, we did have a few thank yous. Uh, firstly, we want to thank P2P for hosting us and for allowing us to be part of their virtual workshop series this year. We do want to again acknowledge our funders, IRCC, and thank the members of the Project Advisory Committee and the LIPS that they represented. We also want to extend a huge thank you to the research team at NEST that worked on this project. So this includes the principal investigator, Victoria Essays, and the graduate research assistants, Allegra, Desmond, Cornelius, Nelson, Shweta, Rita, Hania, and Valeria. So you can access the full report on the P2P website through this QR code. Uh, feel free to reach out to us directly with any questions, comments, or if you'd like a direct link to the report, uh, our, our email addresses should be on the screen. And we now move on to the Q&A portion of the workshop. I'm gonna be moderating and as Sophia mentioned, feel free to type the questions into the chat or use the raise hand function. Uh, we're open to any comments and thoughts as well. So please provide any feedback or questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing for now. I'll give everyone a couple of minutes, probably typing out their um, questions and probably thinking through. There was a lot of information in there. And as we're thinking about this, um, perhaps we could uh, discuss how much of this or whether any of this resonated with you. I'm sure a lot of the folks in the audience uh, work in the settlement sector one way or another. And so we're really interested to hear from you whether there was any um, anything that seemed familiar, anything that seemed surprising, and perhaps reflect a little bit on your own experiences, both professionally and personally. So I see one question in the chat here. Uh, would you conduct this study again with a bigger pool of participants? Um, Emily, perhaps you can talk us through the, the number of participants that we ended up having and if it's possible to conduct it again. Yeah, sure. So we were originally hoping to have a bigger group of participants, um, and especially because we are we are looking at you know multiple regions, um, and so more participants provides us with um, you know more representation of of the areas that we're looking at. Um, we did find it a little bit challenging though to recruit the number of participants that we were looking to recruit. Um, especially in some of the smaller communities, um, which is probably not surprising. There are, you know, fewer newcomers in some of those smaller communities. We did have representation from every community that we were looking at, um, but some of them we had much more representation, which is probably not surprising. Um, I will say, though, I mean, for a qualitative study, though, um, and, you know, the numbers are a little bit less um, crucial then for quantitative analyses. So I think the sample size that we had for this study was sufficient. Um, but of course, it would be great to, to be able to hear from more people, um, especially because we were not targeting a, a, a sample that was representative. Um, so this was through, our, our sampling was more through snowball sampling. Um, and convenience sampling. So just whoever saw our recruitment material um, and, and was eligible, then we welcomed them to participate. Um, so, so yeah, it, it would be nice to, to try to do it with a more representative sample, but I do think that the sample we had um, still provided a lot of really meaningful data. Um, so I don't think that it, it necessarily um, um, reduces the, the importance of the findings that we have here. Thanks, Emily. Um, and just quickly, the sample size for newcomer respondents was 94, and for key informants was 15. I just noticed a comment somewhere asking us to repeat that. Um, so there are a few questions coming in the chat. I do encourage you all to use the raise hand function. We'd love to see you and hear from you. Um, in the meantime, uh, one question is, could you recommend EDI training courses that are suitable for staff complements? It's hard to find courses that are for a large amount of staff at prices we can afford. And there are funding sources that can be, and are there funding sources that can be applied for to get the money for the courses or free courses? Um, I think I can just start off by saying that 
this uh, sentiment that you're sharing, Kat, was very much echoed in the interviews. A lot of the key informants really highlighted the need for this kind of training to be mandatory, to be provided by the organizations themselves, and to be paid. Um, so it is very much a sentiment that we saw uh, reflected in the interviews. So thank you for the question. Um, Sophia and Emily, do you have any suggestions for specific uh, resources or maybe places to find them? Um, we didn't have those kinds of resources directly uh, linked in the report or kind of directly related to the study. I do think um, P2P is a good source to kind of go through some of the recommendations and some of the other ways that they've suggested. Um, but you can um, email us a little bit later and we can try and help find those resources. Unfortunately, I can't, I can't, I don't think we have any right now. Um, Another question indicates what explains the gap in the perception of discrimination between key informants or service providers and racialized clients. Sophia, do you want to speak on this? Definitely. Thank you for your question, Muhi. Um, I see this gap. Um, well, our our based on our analysis, and we we considered this as potentially what we covered in different types of discrimination, that discrimination can be both the interpersonal or systemic, and within that spectrum can be more explicit, so more obvious forms of racism, and implicit, so let's say more subtle subtle forms uh, that, that uh, are harder to report, are harder to um, uh, put into a mechanism to, to report it, for example. And uh, we considered it to be more of an implicit bias happening here, not potentially not um, service providers not understanding or unintentionally uh, creating a context where they think everything is happening fine. And then the reaction of the new current participants is another kind of reality. It could potentially be implicit bias. Um, considering our sample as well, this is not something that we want to generalize across uh across uh communities or populations is something that we saw within our specific sample and that's something that could potentially be happening in other settlement service aid organizations but in general i think we can focus on how subtle forms of discrimination really shape the experiences of newcomer uh racialized newcomers that we see in our study and the ways that they are both ha uh, finding trouble to specifically describe this type of discrimination they're experiencing and the places that they're experiencing. So I think it are those types of uh, trends within discrimination that could potentially explain this gap, uh, but something that I think is a gap that a lot more research is needed into it, a lot more projects. Um, and so we're excited to uh, continue this work. Thank you. I just wanted to add as well, I think that's why this type of research, like qualitative research that actually gets at people's personal experiences is so important because if you were just looking at numbers, um, you know, it, things might look different. Or again, this is why we use sort of, sort of an indirect approach, because if we ask people specifically about discrimination, they might not necessarily think of their experience as being discrimination based on their understanding of what discrimination is. But then, and some people I think even said, you know, I've never experienced discrimination, but then they would describe something, an experience they'd had that was discrimination. So that's why this type of research where you're actually talking to people and getting getting detailed information about their experiences is so useful. Definitely, thank you both. Um, there's quite a few comments and questions rolling in the chat here. Um, there was a, a question that was sent to me directly regarding what anti-discrimination resources would be ideal to train staff asking to please share links and resources and videos. Um, luckily, some folks have started chiming in the chat discussing um, organizations that they know of that potentially provide such resources and uh, some area specific resources as well. Um, we might not have time to go over all of them, but please check the chat if you are able to and kind of get connected. We're happy to connect you to each other as well, but the chat function is kind of the best way and the most direct way to do that. 
Um, Melanie had a couple comments. I'm aware of another project underway on another important critical topic like this. They have chosen a very similar approach with 100 participants or 94 in our case. Experts consider this a good sample size for qualitative research. Thank you, Melanie. Again, this is kind of echoing what um, Emily had said. And uh, uh, FYI, our organization is over 60% diverse. A BIPOC organization surveyed us and said diversity training was needed for all. Whether someone is new at Canada and there are slight nu nuances to what is politically correct, or whether they bring their own cultural biases alongside Canadian employees' biases, the biggest learning we had from this is all need diversity and culturally competency training. Uh, thank you, Melanie. Again, I think this is very much echoed in, in the interviews and in the report. A question by Fatima. Are you considering uh, conducting such research with the aim of enhancing employment opportunities for newcomers and potentially reducing biases and discrimination? Would anyone like to address this? And then, uh, Dorian, I see your hand is up, so we'll address that next. Yeah, so I mean, I think that this research has potential applications in in lots of different places, and it would be important for um, you know employers to be aware uh, of this type of stuff. Um, I will mention that we are currently working on another project with the City of London and the London Middlesex Local Immigration a Partnership, where we are working on um, resources for. Um, promoting anti-hate initiatives um, specifically related to immigration and um, busting myths related to immigrants um, and in different different areas. So including immigrants and housing, uh, immigrants and education and immigrants and employment. Um, so this is going, this is something that we're currently developing um, resources um, and workshops to be provided um, to public audiences, to organizations, um, and with the hope of busting some of these myths and and making um, making things more equitable. Um, and that will be posted on the City of London website as soon as we are completed that, which which should be within the next month or so. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, absolutely. Those are very important resources and. Uh, those partially or the need for those resources partially came from previous research that we had worked on through NEST with, with uh, the City of London, with the LM LIP and with some of the other LIPs as well. Um, so it's really rewarding and really interesting kind of seeing how those studies are building upon each other and kind of seeing how this collaboration between researchers and community organizations is um, trying to identify where the need is and then trying to work on developing these kinds of resources. Um, Dorian, would you like to unmute and speak to us? Sure, thank you. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question. I just realized that someone was asking about training, um, being that a lot of people are small businesses and they don't have the funds to do so. Um, we are currently working with the local immigration partnership with another partnership in the community that's going to be offering um, some free licensing of intercultural EDI training. Um, unfortunately, the caveat is that you have to be in the Sarnia Lambton area or have a reach into the Sarnia Lambton area. So if that's any of you on the call, feel free to reach out to me personally um, and I can make that connection for you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. That's definitely very helpful. Um, I see one question from Bidushi. Thank you, Bidushi. Uh, in terms of enhancing awareness about settlement services, could you provide concrete examples of how organizations can effectively reach out to improve the accessibility of information for newcomers. Typically, the responsibility falls on newcomers to seek out this information. Also, do you have plans to extend this research uh, on this topic? Um, so maybe let's start with the first one, thinking about um, concrete examples to improve the accessibility. Any of you want to? Kick it yeah, off. I can I can get started on that one. I had for that first question, I will definitely say to improve the accessibility of information is I would really consider how the knowledge information is traveling in between organizations and how that's ending up in your in your organization. For example, what are the supports 
locally to your organization that could improve, um, you know, the staff that are newcomers and immigrants, specifically racialized newcomers and immigrants in your organization. To look at that local ecosystem, I think, is is where you can start first. And um, as well as, because like, like you mentioned, the this information typically falls on newcomers and it could be kind of a, a bridge, right? How are you connected to the newcomers, but as well as how are they connecting to you and finding the information back to your organization? And it's definitely, I would say, looking at the relationship between organizations in your local area, looking at the, at the, um, uh, and as well as the possible the supports from the city of London, there's always great resources available there as a central hub to uh, what is available to newcomers, the P2P website and the local London and Middlesex Local Immigration Partnership, you know, to everyone who's local to London. Um, specifically, they offer uh, uh, more concrete examples. Sorry if that is, I know those are broad suggestions, not concrete, uh, but I think it really depends on the needs of your organization. If you would like, connect with me and we can provide some more tailored responses. Thank you, Badushi. Thank you, Sophia. Um, and building off of the findings from the study themselves, I think there were some wonderful examples that the respondents provided when asked about strategies. So Things like having a centralized, uh, a centralized location for information and resources. Things like um, having support networks where word of mouth is another way that is very accessible for folks to share information and get information. So involving organizations in those kind of informal settings that will allow for information to travel informally, but also make sure that it's correct information and not misinformation that is being shared. Um, so support networks, um, really like centralizing the information. There was another one that I just lost. Um, but I think the interviews were like a very, um, contained a lot of wealth of examples that will probably be covered in the report somewhat. Emily, anything else you can think of right now? No, that's essentially what I was going to add as well. So you've covered it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I see there's a question by Thali on how would you address questions about how newcomers are contributing to the economy and culture of London? And perhaps we can uh, generalize the question to all the communities. Yeah, so I, I'm, I guess um, maybe just to start, I, I will say that, um, as I mentioned, we are working on a series of resources specifically for London. Um, looking at busting myths about about newcomers and their connection in different in, in different sectors and so one of them is about newcomers and employment and so this is something that is going to be covered in some of those resources that we're preparing um looking at um you know the value that newcomers provide to the canadian economy um in terms of you know their their willingness to work the fact that many of them work multiple jobs um, the fact that many of them, um, because they come from diverse backgrounds, they have connections to diverse um, di diverse places, which helps to diversify the economy. Um, if they're if they are able to set up, you know, businesses um, that that deal with diverse places. Um, so yeah, this is something that that will be included in some of the materials that we are preparing um, and. and and um, will be available on the City of London website. Um, and it'll also include some workshops that the um, London Middlesex LIP will be providing um, to different organizations and audiences. Um, so that's kind of, some of that information is, is in works, I will say. And to add, thank you, Emily, to add to that, I also uh, mentioned that the, uh, London Millsex Local Immigration Partnership also has a Matters of Fact series, which also shares, I think we're going to be posting our 30, 
number 35 uh, in, the, in the next weeks. Um, and those are matters of fact, which basically have a myth, for example, um, you know, the common myth of, you know, newcomers are taking all the jobs. And then we have a statistic and the fact at the bottom that it kind of explains actually what is actually happening in the context of London. So all those facts are specific to London. Um, and those are reused. Rec uh, actually, uh, recently we got picked up by CBC and CTV that that they love that kind of positivity about newcomer uh, stories and immigrant success stories rather than what the media picks up as tends to be more negative, funnel driven. So um, that is another series as well, if you would uh, like to use that in your organization. Thank you, Sophia. Um, just going back to Fatima's question, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, Fatima, but one of the uh, one of the studies that we conducted at Nest in collaboration with the LM Lib. Uh, did focus on uh, discrimination that is experienced in public places and in workplaces. And at the end of that report, uh, we provided a lot of recommendations on ways that workplaces specifically can try to address the discrimination that is being experienced by both patrons and uh, workers, um, and trying to kind of look at reducing a lot of the stereotyping and the discrimination and the bias that exists within their organizations. Um, so that might be a first step, as well as many of the other resources that have kind of been mentioned and Emily mentioned are coming on the way. Um, we do have around 10 minutes of our scheduled time, so we do have some time for more questions. Um, Kat asked that you please post the link to the information about the myth-busting facts, so Sophia, thank you. Uh, we will be sharing the slides. Uh, P2P is going to be sharing the slides on their website, I believe. Um, Mitch uh, had a comment here. Something that stood out to me was staff not knowing their organization's anti-discrimination policies. Maybe more training needs to be done on making sure internal policies are being understood and followed, as well as finding additional training for staff. Thank you for that comment, Mitch, and perhaps we can um, add to that as well, Sophia and Emily, if you had any thoughts. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll start off shortly. I, I agree that is a sentiment that was shared both by newcomer uh, immig uh, by newcomers and by the key informants. So that was definitely emphasized. And that's something that we that's uh, our motivation for also making it our number one recommendation, not that they're in order of importance, but to say if you're going to focus on something, really having that zero tolerance policy that is consistently and intentionally communicated to staff of all levels within the organization. Because um, like we mentioned earlier, there were some gaps in, for example, who was who was accessible to the training you know there's emphasis on being a client center a client focused uh for example representative or a uh, who provides specific services but what about the front of the frontline staff the admin uh the maintenance staff and that's the thing your organization is part of this entangled network of people that could potentially have uh uh you know maybe some implicit bias maybe some unconscious behaviors that can create a situation that can be potentially discriminatory um, and a context of microaggressions, for example. So I'm um, definitely communicating that to all levels of staff and having that policy displayed publicly. You know, for example, if I can compare to the LIMLIP here, we have one on our health and safety board that is just the policy. So, you know, having that in a place where all staff know they can read it, I think is a great place to start if anyone wants to add to that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think um, one interview or one uh, anecdote that really stuck out to me uh, during the interviews was a key informant that had kind of discussed the experience of discrimination that she had heard one of the newcomer respondents telling her about. And it was that they experienced discriminatory behavior at the reception before they were able to even get into the organization to access the settlement providers and access the settlement service department, let's call it. Um, so again, like we highlight the importance of training being for everyone, training being accessible, like you mentioned, and the training being in a way that folks can like really take the perspective, really understand the impact and really hear testimonials from the newcomers themselves to somewhat humanize these experiences 
rather than them just being, you know, this like mandatory video that you click through and you're not 100% maybe internalizing or fully understanding what is being said. So thank you, Mitch. That's definitely th something that's come up in the report as well. Um, as a reminder, the slides as well as the recording of the session is going to be available at P2P website. So as you can see, the session is currently being report, uh, recorded, so that will all be there. And the full report is already on the P2P website. So that was where the QR code that we provided earlier was going to um, link you to. Um, we have a couple more uh, minutes here. Uh, again, we'd love to hear from you regarding if any of this resonated with your experience or maybe surprised you at all. Um, I'd love for anyone to point out if I may have missed any information. I know there was uh, a lot of productive chat regarding uh, some resource sharing and some interest in different kinds of resources, uh, which we really, really appreciate. I'll give it another minute. And, May I uh, share something very quickly? Please go ahead. Um, I have to leave in a few minutes, but I'm... So I was at an event a few days ago where I was invited to be a speaker. Um, the It was a non-profit organization and I was invited to speak there. Uh, I'm an immigrant. And I've been in the community for more than 20 years. I've volunteered. I earned my share to be invited to be the keynote speaker. Um, and in that organization, actually many years ago, I used to volunteer and hence they know me and hence the invitation. Um, the board of that organization is very white. Very, very white, like 90%. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe this is me reading it too much into it. And I've been working, I've been in this field for so long. After my my talk, my speech, I got really good compliments from a lot of um, members who were there. But the board never came to me. They never came to me. They never said anything. Even the board chair, after my speech, who went back to the podium to introduce the next part of the agenda, to not even acknowledge me. Didn't even say like, oh, that was a great speech or a bad speech or we had, or some, nothing. The, and then she introduced the next person on the agenda who came and talked about volunteerism. And she in fact said, My, um, that was a, that is hard to follow with. That was, so she made some, a good two sentence comment there. I don't know. Um, maybe I'm reading too much and it just, just happened recently. So it's just brewing in my head. Um, but while leaving the board, again, all of them were in a circle talking all by themselves. I, It was came really hard to me, but I went there, broke the circle and said hi to them. Look into the eye of everybody. And I said, thank you for giving this opportunity. Still two people ignored me. So maybe it's nothing. Maybe I'm reading into something. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Abiha. Thank you for sharing that experience. It's definitely not easy and, and we really appreciate it. I, I don't think you're reading into things. And again, I think this is very much echoed by a lot of racialized folks and a lot of immigrants that we spoke with. This is why we avoided using the word discrimination because there are different interpretations to what discrimination is or could be. But um, if you felt excluded and if anyone feels excluded and feels like certain behavior was preferential to, to certain folks over others, then that is very much discriminatory, at least in our view. Um, I see someone else has echoed your sentiment regarding the lack of diversity on certain boards. And that is something that is a huge issue that needs to be addressed in, in these types of organizations. Unfortunately, the lack of diversity and lack of representation often trickles down to everyone and often impacts everyone, both those who work in the in the um, in the organizations and those who do interact with them, uh, maybe tangentially or otherwise. Um, so it is a huge issue that needs to be addressed, I think, all over Canada, but particularly in small and mid-sized communities. So thank you so much for sharing that experience and 
we're really hoping things are, are changing to the better, but definitely not, not quick enough. Um, I thank you all uh, for, for your comments. We are at 2.15. There was one final question that I did want us to address. Maybe Emily, you can quickly speak on uh, why wasn't Windsor included in the study? Yeah, so I guess, um, I think I guess it's because um, when when the study was was when we were applying for funding for the study, the the um, the lips were partners in that um, application. Um, so um, the the lips and representing the regions, the eight regions that we looked at, um, were were a part of that application, and and so those were the regions that we focused on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it would be really interesting to expand. There are other communities, um, regions that we didn't look at in southwestern Ontario. So, you know, the 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 study was not, you know, um, totally comprehensive of of all areas of the region. Um, but you know, I, I do think that there are a lot of similarities between some of the communities in this region, and so the results would still be applicable. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And and again, I think um, at the time that these grants were written and at the time that these research uh, studies get done, a lot of who gets involved and who doesn't is very much dependent on available resources. Mm -hmm. Folks might not have time or folks might not have the funding or there's a lot of considerations that goes in. Um, but we try to make it as inclusive and as representative of as many communities as possible. But it was uh, limited to the organizations who were available to partner with us and the kind of time and the a lot of those kinds of considerations. But thank you for the question. And hopefully in the future, there will be uh, more studies or similar studies that look at different uh, regions that perhaps we weren't able to in this study. So we are past our scheduled time. I do want to thank everyone for uh, the discussion, thank them for the questions and comments, and thank you all for listening and sitting through this Tuesday afternoon with us. Thank you to Emily and Sophia. And again, thank you very much to P2P.